Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, this is uh, perhaps a little bit difficult talk for, for this moment because uh, it's not so uh, give you a lot of information but ask you to think about what we are trying to do. You've probably heard about this fracture healing. Uh, we need some movement. Uh, we need two parts to, to have some kind of a movement in order to heal. Uh, so we're going to revisit, uh, some of you have heard about this, the, the strain theory. Uh, we will look at the stiffness of the locking implants that all of us are using right now, and the so-called case of a lag screw uh, cross in, in case you use the locking plates. You have seen uh, cases like this, that relative stability, so-called flexible fixation, works in most uh, facial fractures, Whereas sometimes you have failures if you have cases like this when you have uh, not enough stability. So we know that too rigid doesn't give you healing and too uh, unstable also give you no healing. So how much is enough is always a difficult part that we think of. So let's take a look at this case. It's, uh, uh, you, when you look at it, you will often think what, what, uh, what's wrong with this case. I mean, it's a simple, relatively simple uh, distal femur fractures in a 38-year-old man. So when I'm, probably at this time we won't have much time for discussion, but uh, it, it, looking at this case, it gives me always uh, think what, what, what uh, the surgeon has done. And uh, so this was being done. The surgeon did a MIPO, okay? When going back to this, you, you have a fracture that with a spiral wedge over there. So the surgeon decided, since there's not much displacement, just to splint it, just to splint it with a lag screw, and then perform a MIPO fixations. So when you look at it, eventually we are actually doing a MIPO fixation, a minimally invasive plate fixation, for a simple fracture type, not relative to what we call type A fracture, because the surgeon has put in a lax screw, a lax screw for the proximal fragment. So I looked at the post-op X-ray and I thought something. I feel something may may not be uh, correct, but I cannot say uh, wrong because uh, the the reduction uh, was done in a relatively minimally invasive manner, and and it's uh, on the lateral view is actually quite good. And the surgeon thinks uh, to protect it, we have to keep it non-weight bearing. So is it, is it correct non-weight bearing in this fracture? So six months down the line, six months down the line, what do we see? We do not see any bit of a callus at the distal fracture area. We see the healing of the proximal fracture site, but over the initial, we see a widening, actually see a widening of the fracture gap. So what went wrong? That comes to my mind. What went wrong? The patient has been uh, uh, have a, uh, some persistent pain over it. So that's why we always go back to the strain theory, as uh, I'm sure the trauma surgeons in the room will know. That uh, has been proposed by Professor Perrin um, almost like 40 years ago, because when we talk about the mesenchymal stem cells, it can differentiate into all sorts of things. It depends on the mechanical situation that what kind of cells this uh, MSC will turn into. So it's been pointed out by Perrin almost 40, for almost 40 years ago that if you have a deformation, if you have a deformation more than 2%, then only fibrous and granulation tissues will be formed. I think this is a very useful, that all of our bases, uh, when we try to fix a fracture, we try to think about this strain theory. That means a slight deformation of 2% will not get your fractures healed. But when we take a look at it, uh, the first thought is that, I mean, 2% is really relatively little. I think, okay, very little. Is this really true? It, does a bone formation only stand like 2% deformation? For me, I mean, that's always a query about it. And again, that when we take a look at it, what is the strain theory? We, we actually look at the gap and also the micromotion. The so-called the interfragmentary strain is the so-called the delta L, the micromotion 
is divided by the gap. That is what we call the interfragmentary strain. When we take a look at many of the animal models, if you have too narrow a gap, the natural tendency is for the fracture gap to get widened as a result of a bone resorption. And it is a very clever way. I mean, why do we always get bone resorption even if you have a crack fracture? It is because if, even if you have a crack fracture, you need the gap to widen a little bit in order for the healing to start. Again, this is the basis of the interfermentary strain. That is the micro motion divided by the gap, the width of the gap. So, I mean, simple mathematics. The interfermentary strain is decreased when the gap, but if the interfermentary strain is also increased when the gap is narrowed. So it's very difficult in common sense when we always have a fracture being fixed like this, and sometimes they heal and sometimes they don't. So to me, I mean, is this 2% movement really true? I mean, 2% is really little for me. That's why, again, many, many of the uh, researchers also try to study and try to answer this. I mean, is this really true? I think that has been pointed out by uh, some researchers in the past that actually the bone can withstand more than 2% uh, elongations. In, in more, mainly in animal studies, that the bone can tolerate much higher initial movement, like 2 to 10 percent. And in another researcher by Klaus, it shows that it can, the interfragmentary strain can be up to 5 to 15 percent. And they have done studies to try to confirm that how much micro motion will the bone stand. Again, this is a very good study, and it, it shows, I mean, they create a three millimeter gap. They create a three millimeter gap, and then they try to load the condyle of a femur of an animal by putting some force over there. So on one end, on the intact surface over there, there is no micromotion. On the other end, there is excessive micromotion. So what do they find out? They, they look at it, so which, of, which part will form the bone? So that will tell us what is the best interfragmentary strain in order to form some bone. So it was found out that the, uh, around 20% to 30% of interfragmentary strain, it actually can stimulate the callus formation. That is to say, I mean, it's not 2%, but we can allow like 20 to 30% interfragmentary strain in order to form bones. However, to say that it is very difficult because in real surgery, we cannot measure how, how stable the bone, the fixation is, and we cannot measure how much interfragmentary strain each, each fixation is. However, we can have a rough guideline. For example, when we took at, look at the X-fix, why, why do X-fix, they always try to form some callus? It's because they allow, I mean, the interfragmentary motion of that fracture being fixed by the X-fix is roughly about 1 to 3 mm. So by treating it with an X-fix, you allow about 1 to 3 millimeter micromotion. So conforming with that, that means you have a gap, you can have a fracture gap of roughly about less uh, 0 0.8 to about 1 centimeter. If you times 3, 1, one uh, millimeter or 3 millimeter times 3, that is roughly in the region of a uh, one centimeter. However, if you look at a case of a locking plate, a rigid locking plate over the lateral or, or opposite cortex, it only allows a very little micromotion, only less than 0 0.5 mm. Only 0 0.5 mm. So when the patients try to walk, only very little micromotion on the opposite side of the cortex. And that's why it depends on how much gap we are, we are putting in. And interesting enough is also the time of loading, okay? Many a times when we do a meeple, we often ask ourselves, we have to protect the weight bearing. But protect for how long? How long should we ask the patient to weight bear? If we protect it for too long, it's also been shown in animals that if you protect, if you protect and uh, give the, the animal non-weight bearing, prevent it from weight bearing, it actually delay the, the formation of a bone. 
it actually delays the formation of bone. It has been shown that early micromotion increases the bone formation. It's because when it's very interesting, all the mechanobiology of all these tissue that is forming, you really need to stress it. Once you don't stress it, if you protect it, they don't form bone. And it's also a time frame that six weeks, if you're not applying any weight bearing within six weeks, you're actually impairing your bone formation. And that's why, that's why when we take a look at all these uh, uh, bridging, when we try to bridge a simple fracture with or without locking, it is often the result of a delayed healing. So that's why when you try to bridge, do a bridge plating for a simple fracture, for me, I think that is a, the most tricky, the most difficult uh, decisions in trauma surgery. Again, when we take a look at this, why will will, will form some bone and why, why will not form some bone? The locking implants are very difficult because look at the case of a tomofix. For the tomofix, there is a big gap there and on the opposite cortex, it actually there are some contact and there are a gradient of the interfragmentary strain. And looking at it, if you have a too rigid fixation over the near cortex, just underneath the tomofix, there are no bone formation, no bone formation, because the interfragmentary strain is just too, too, too low. People have tried to dynamize it, okay, dynamize it, and uh, this is the result is of a so-called natural dynamization. This again is, is a gap there on the opposite cortex, so what does uh, nature do? The nature will try to dynamize the fracture by breaking all the screws, by breaking all the screws. So this is uh, some kind of a natural dynamization. Because uh, if you put a plate, if you do a MEPO, there are eccentric kind of a micromotion. On the near cortex, near, under the plate, there is very little micromotion. And sometimes they break. Some years ago, the AO tried to develop uh, this, what we call the dynamic locking screw. I think it's a very clever design. However, uh, because of the difficulty in, in manufacturing, I think it's been put on hold. But I think, it's, I, I, for me, it's a very clever design because it allows some kind of a micro motion, both near and also across the fracture, uh, or across the plate. So as you can see, a very quick uh, healing of the fracture and the, look at the callus, they are, they are really very uniform. You, do, you don't have a callus on the opposite side of the cortex, but rather a uniform formation of the callus. And that's the beauty of it. And that's why I think uh, that in future, we definitely need to think about some, something that can dynamize a locking plate. So the last question is often, we often face is, we try to do a bridge plating, but often we found out a big fragment that is on the opposite cortex. Uh, that's, uh, you, you look at it, you not feel too comfortable if you leave it behind. But if you try to fix it, it, it is quite difficult. So what should we do with a fragments like this? There has been some papers that uh, the people have pointed out if the gap is too big, greater than like uh, 5 mm or up to 1 cm, then you have a delay in healing of that fracture gap. Again, we can try to use uh, what we call the reduction screws to put the fragments together. But for many surgeons, they often confuse the reduction screw with the lag screw. Okay? So if you put a, fra uh, a screw across the fracture gap and try to bring, draw the opposite cortex together, you're also, you're also almost like putting in a lag screw as well. So you look at this, the reduction looks good. The reduction looks good, but you're actually putting in a lag screw. And now you, the micro motion, think about the micro motion. On the near side, underneath the plate, there are very little micro motion. And now with the lag screw on the other side of the plate, you also have very little micro motion. So it's uh, been pointed out in a case report that for cases like this, you can have a dynamization of the fracture. Look at it, I mean, the reduction looks good but then there are no callus formation because you, you have limited the amount of micromotion on it. And by removing, removing this, the lag screw, now you are creating, you are creating the uh, more, more micromotion and the fracture gradually heals with callus formation. 
And that's why a lot of uh, uh, surgeons now, this is uh, uh, from uh, Professor Yang in Korea, also a very good trauma surgeon, has also tried to advocate the use of this reduction or, or the term like apposition, appositional screw, bringing the fragments closer together. And uh, this has been shown to be beneficial in many of the cases when we do the MIPO. But last but not least, of course, uh, uh, we also have to know that we have to load the, uh, the limb. Otherwise, there will be, no matter how close it is, if you don't load the limb, there will be no micromotion. And that's why, it, again, this is not a cookbook, but try to think about it and encourage the patients to have early uh, weight bearing. That is always, always very good for the callus formation. It's always a balance between the stability and the biology. Because time is up, so we have to go to the summary. That's, uh, we have to think about the uh, healing process. It depends on the interfragmentary strain. And uh, so-called strain theory is not 2%. I, I don't think it's a 2% interfragmentary strain that will form bone. But rather, we have been shown that it is roughly about 10% to 30% of interfragmentary strain. That is very good for the uh, so-called sweet spot for the bone formation. Early weight bearing within, within six weeks time is crucial and it stimulates the callus formation and has been pointed out uh, by various papers. The use of a locking plate is good for the comminuted fractures, but to do a meepo for a simple fracture is one of the most difficult uh, uh, decisions that one would, would, would know. How much gap is tolerated is still unknown. So, but sometimes if you do see a, a large fragment that is quite far apart, leaving a big gap, more than like a 5 mm or 1 cm, then it is advisable to use a screw to try to draw it closer together so that there will be faster fracture healing. However, those screw, that, that screw should not be a lag screw because lag screw decreases micromotion. So it's not a lag screw. So with that, thank you very much for your attention.